Hello everyone, and welcome back to Let's Play Kyoku Megami Tensei 2. Last time, we finally left the starting area of the game and headed north to Shinagawa, where we ended up befriending Orthrus, who was bothering the people there. But uh, we have joined forces and are now going to uh, Tokyo Tower, so that we can investigate uh, rumors of a mysterious witch that is inhabiting the area. But before we can do that... Uh, we did also run into a uh, religious man, a messian, who was stuck in the sewers trying to traverse the tunnels there so that uh, he could attend some meeting or something like that with his church, but uh, was being prevented from doing so because of a uh, monster that was blocking the way. So we are going to solve that problem for our uh, messian friend. But uh, before we can do that, I just wanted to stop by the starting area again so that I could uh, heal up. This is actually where I discovered that the nurse uh, in her clinic here, right at the uh, starting shelter, uh, only actually heals the human party members and will not heal your demons. You have to go all the way back to the ded uh, dedicated uh, healing uh, church to uh, actually patch up your demons from their injuries and revive them and stuff. I decided to take a look and see what we could fuse using the uh, demons that we recruited from the Princess Hotel uh, in the cathedral here, and there's only one real possible fusion result. Those uh, either they're going to result in kind of like dud demons or those yellow uh, marks denote that we already have those demons, so can't fuse them. You can't have two of the same demon in your party, unfortunately, so even then, you know, they say variety is the spice of life, so... Just gonna carefully choose who we want to bring into this next battle, though, spoiler alert, because we have Orthrus, which, as you can see, is a a fair bit more powerful than than our usual run-of-the-mill demons for this part of the game. Um, kind of taking the place of um, uh, Cerberus usually does in, in these early Mega Ten games. In both Kyuyaku Megami Tensei 1 and Shin Megami Tensei 1, you get Cerberus. Uh, kind of towards the start, or you can get Cerberus kind of towards the start, uh, and and you kind of coast through the game for a bit just because uh, Cerberus is real good. Um, maybe we'll see Cerberus later on in this playthrough. Ho ho ho! But uh, Orthrus has kind of taken taken the uh, place as our starter uh, as our starter doggy friend. Uh, that's going to be a very good ally for us early on here. And we are going to just retrace our steps back to the sewer. Once again, going to just climb down, pass over that Pazuzu tile. Let's see if it says anything new this time. Oh, yeah, we, we saw that already. Just skipping right on over that. And let's see what we got in wait here. Oh, well, that's not the boss. I thought it was the boss. Oops. We just beat up some slimes. There we go. <laughs> that's the boss. Uh, this fight ain't too bad, though you maybe want to bring in some demons that have uh, more than, like, 15 HP. <laughs> uh, that's why I, uh, I, I didn't bother taking Carbuncle into the fight. Carbuncle's kind of at a point where... Uh, can't really expect it to live long in any of these boss fights. And you can see that our uh, the difference in power between us and the rest of our demons and Orthrus is uh, substantial. So, yeah. Made quick work of it. Word is spreading fast of our many accomplishments. We're only on episode 4. Ryu, you're starting, you're starting to get full of yourself. Just a, just a little bit. Alright, well, with that out of the way, let's go back <laughs> into town now. Yeah, there's nothing in that room. As soon as that guy uh, sees that the boss is dead, he just tails it out of there. And when you pass over it, you just get a little message saying that's where the Jabberwock was. If I recall, the Jabberwock will reappear later on in the game as just a normal encounter. I always like when RPGs do that. It really helps you feel accomplished. Like, oh, this thing used to be a boss fight, and now it's just 
some random loser that I can beat up on while I'm walking around. I also love this enemy design. You know, M Megami Tensei is known for its takes on mythological t uh, creatures and um, different uh, demons and spirits and, you know, all that sort of thing. Stuff from folklore, all that. Um, sometimes the series can just really crank out designs for uh, just cool concepts like, hey, it's a lobster with insect wings and, and, and it just turns out really nice and well. Uh, sometimes when it allows itself to kind of branch out and do something a little simpler like that, I, I think it pays off well. Who knows, maybe that dead lobster is actually based off of some obscure legend or something that I'm just unaware of, but... And any fan of Kyuyaku Megami Tensei 1 will recognize this minigame. Ariake is the town we just reached, and it's the first of three what I like to call gambling towns that you're going to run into in this game. So unlike the first game, where there's one spot to go to uh, play all these minigames, there's actually going to be three different communities that we're going to run into that uh, each offer different variants of the slots minigames, uh, big and small, and also the arena. Uh, the slots and big and small both carry over from uh, Kyuyaku Megami Tensei 1. Uh, the arena is new, and then there's also a uh, kind of special premium minigame called uh, Code Breaker, which uh, if you've played, uh, I, I know at least Persona 1, I'm not sure if it's in Persona 2 as well off the top of my head, but I know it's at least in Persona 1. Um, it's a, uh, another gambling minigame that you can play, but you need some metal cards before you can play that one. Um, so, unfortunately, I am sad to report that the gambling minigame is not as completely busted as it is in Kyuyaki Megami Tensei 1, at least not for now. Um, each of the different communities, uh, will give you, uh, progressively better results. So, this first one right here... Uh, playing big and small and playing uh, the slots here, you're not going to get the best rewards. Uh, Codebreaker actually too scales with uh, uh, those three, uh, slots, big and small, and uh, Codebreaker. Uh, all three will scale with uh, which community you choose to play them in. Um, the, uh, the later on in the game you are and you reach those uh, later communities. Uh, the better the results will be and the more worth your time it will be to use them for grinding up for money. This first one right here, kind of a, kind of a, it feels like a tourist trap. It's, it's like a real casino. Uh, maybe have a little bit of fun and, and uh, try try the odds, but don't expect to make a lot of bank off of this. You're probably going to end up just uh, wasting your time and money. So, yeah, um, unfortunately we're going to have to wait a bit until we get to that third gambling spot before we can really take advantage of this. But even then, I find that um, in this game in particular, it's not the greatest option. So, yeah, we can't even play Codebreaker until we get metal cards, which we get either from uh, winning uh, really, uh, you know, winning big uh, payouts in the slots or big and small. Uh, you can get metal cards that way. You can also get metal cards uh, from random drops from some human enemies uh, on the overworld map, uh, actually kind of close to Tokyo Tower and kind of around this general area, so... We'll wait for now, and then also there's actually a town later on in the game that uh, we'll get to where we can just buy metal cards for uh, $200 a pop, so... But first, let's get some wonderful drugs. Say fuck it. Just say yes. Let's have Ryu try it, though. Oh, damn. Ryu got allergies. We can't. Can't do it. You just get kicked out. Okay. Takuma's gonna need to take one for the team here. Let's do it. So I'm going to be completely honest with you, I don't know what the vast majority of these do, which is half the fun, probably. But, uh, if, you, if you keep going, there will be consequences, which you will see. Oh no, that's exactly the last thing you want to hear someone say when they're taking wonderful drugs. Sumo Super C sounds like a very tasty Sunny D ripoff, actually. I would drink that. 
Yeah, let's do it. What does the P stand for? Yeah! We're paralyzed! <laughs> Ah, uh, well, that's unfortunate, but, you know. Now that we've taken drugs, let's go to the bar and talk to the patrons there. Damn! Okay, Doomer. This is some good lore. I like this world building. Got a demon civil war happening. Oh. See, okay, the people in this town, much more positive on the witch, and they're closer, so I'm, I, I kind of believe them more. People back in Shinagawa didn't really seem to know all the details. They were dealing with a very aggressive dog. So yeah, let's get some uh, Paralanon, Paralanon, which is... Some sort of weird over-the-counter medication that we can use to counteract the effects of the other drugs we took. And now we're back to normal. This is just a very... a very special episode of Let's Play Kiyaku Megami Tensei 2. With uh, a lot of good medical tidbits in here. So this, right here, in my opinion, the best way to get money in Kiyaku Megami Tensei 2, at least for, for, for quite a while here. There will be a point where the slots become more efficient, especially towards the end of the game. Uh, but this right here is the Demon Arena. And no matter... There are three different arenas in the game. Uh, they, you know, they appear in a, a couple different spots. Uh, they will always scale with the level of the main character. And, uh, you're gonna want to have demons around your same level, uh, just so that you're going and you actually stand a fighting chance. So if you're, like, level 30, you're gonna want demons kind of around that level, or else you're just gonna get your ass kicked. Um, you get to choose which demon to take into the fight, uh, and you can, you can, as you can see, even after, you know, after you win, you get to swap out who you want to, uh, have participating in the arena. And then it'll run, like, a, a battle simulation to see who wins. And Orthrus, because he's overpowered, uh, is gonna be our cash cow, and <laughs> we could just keep, uh, having Orthrus beat up these demons, and we will, uh, get some easy money early on in the game here. Though he's not invincible, as you can see, they're starting to whittle him down. After you win five times... Yeah, there we go. Orthrus lost, unfortunately. But after you win five times, uh, the uh, arena person will be like, Oh, yeah, you did good. And then uh, you'll you'll get kicked out, and then you can go back and heal or do whatever. But yeah, um, it's a cool way to get some cash, and especially if you have some powerful demons at your disposal. Um... It's just a, a very convenient way to, uh, get money, um, compared to, like, the slots and stuff for right now, which really don't... Even if you do well at the slots right now, it, it, it uh, just takes forever to really get there, and, uh, the money isn't as great. The arena is just more consistent if you have powerful demons. Still can't fuse anything, really? Don't know why I checked? Another terminal. Can warp all the way back to Haneda if we want to right now, which is kind of nice. This terminal in particular we are going to uh, use quite a bit. I, I actually like to use this one uh, just out of habit because the cathedral and the healing spot are both right there. I guess you could go to Haneda for the same thing, but uh, I warp here a lot just to uh, heal up and fuse demons when I need to. 
So I could have entered Tokyo Tower there and just made a beeline for story progression, but I figured the uh, plot can wait for a bit because we went through the sewers and we've kind of entered a more open area, I'd say. Uh, so let's just get a sense of our surroundings and explore a bit and uh, just kind of see what the other parts of this map have to offer. You can see that there's another community to the north, but even more suspicious is this green door in the cliff face that'll lead to a tunnel. Again, just going to take a peek for now and make note of these areas and the fact that they exist, and we'll go explore them more in depth later. And this town up here is Ropangi. You can see that the other parts of Ropangi are blocked off because of these trees. Uh, to get to the other parts of this area, we're going to need to go through this underground tunnel section. Uh, but again, we're just going to take a peek for now, and we'll revisit this section of the map later. You know, one thing I will really say about this game uh, that I have to give it real props for, for the first time doing a overworld map for the Megami Tensei series, I really think they hit it out of the park, at least for the first part of the game here. Um, this game is shockingly open, uh, in my opinion, uh, considering what I, what I kind of thought this game would be going in. Uh, dare I say, this game almost feels a little Metroidvania-esque at times, where uh, there's, a lot of, there's a lot of parts of this game where we're going to be exploring and just making notes uh, regarding some loose threads, and then revisiting certain areas and going back and forth between areas uh, and making story progress that way. It's really fun. Uh, I think that this game's overworld map design is actually a lot better than the map found in SMT1 even, and, and dare I say a lot of other early Megami Tensei games that I've played from this era. Uh, really good stuff. I actually really think that it's one of the highlights of this game, uh, design-wise for me. And, and, you know, I'm... I'm not saying it's good just because it's non-linear, you know? I, I, I'm not someone who thinks that freedom or an open-world design philosophy is necessarily always superior to linearity. Uh, you know, I think it's a matter of execution. There's a lot of linear games that I love a lot more than a lot of, uh, non-linear games. Um... I really think it's just a matter of what the game does with it. Uh, and in this game's case, I think the kind of more open-ended map design and progression approach actually really gives it a sense of discovery and adventure that I find uh, maybe missing from some other uh, Atlas games that I've played from the same time period. So, really good job on that, and it's actually, uh, it, it makes this game very, uh, you know, it, it, it's kind of one of the more memorable uh, aspects of uh, playing through this game and learning this game for me. You can see I'm just <laughs> abusing our time with Orthrus as much as I possibly can. Uh, just constantly winning in the arena. The, the best part about the arena is what you can do is you can... You know, you, you can have a strong demon go through the arena gauntlet, and then when you get out of the arena, you can just heal that demon right back up. Uh, and then just go right back into the arena and go for more rounds. You know, you can keep doing that as long as you have MP, and then when you run out of MP, you go all the way back to Tokyo Tower, heal up there, and then you can go back here and just rinse and repeat. It's a good way to get plenty of money early on in the game. And of course, if, uh, you know, you have a demon die in the arena and you get kicked out, uh, you know, it kind of sucks to have to walk all the way back up to Tokyo Tower and, uh, pay to revive the demon, but... Even this early on, uh, you're probably going to be winning more than you are losing, especially with our pal Orthrus here. Um, so it, it'll all balance out, and uh, you'll be able to get plenty of cash early on here still. So yeah, highly suggest you maybe grind up for funds a bit before you decide to go into Tokyo Tower. We're going to try out big and small again, you know. Had some luck with the arena, why don't we revisit some of the other minigames here? Just complete luck. Just a 50-50 guess. And I love that this game shows you the past results to fuck with you. Uh, because there will be times where all of the numbers up top are, are, are small. You know, they're blue. And you're like, they can't possibly pull out another small number. And the mind games start to, start to trick you. And then of course the game pulls out another small number, even though you guess big. Despite all odds of, you know, saying that it's highly irrational for there to be that many small numbers in a row. Uh, 
And yeah, we, because we won so many times in a row, we got a metal card. So now we can show off Codebreaker. So yeah, unfortunately, Codebreaker is hosted by a racist caricature of an Indian man. Really not great. I don't like Codebreaker in general for reasons that will become apparent much later on in this Let's Play, but yeah, like the shit icing on the cake is just having this racist nonsense attached to it too. Just really not a fan. Thanks a lot, Atlas. But yeah, uh, to explain Codebreaker, it's a puzzle game that uh, is actually pretty fun in its own right. Uh, there's a lot of reasons I don't like Codebreaker that will become more apparent later on in the sluts play but as a as a individual like just looking at the game mechanics itself puzzle game it, it's it's kind of fun uh, you have to guess three different digits and they have to be in the right order so you'll make a guess and then the game will tell you how many hits and how many blows you have a hit means that you have the right number guessed and it's in the right spot a blow means that you have a right number but it's in the wrong spot so you're essentially, uh, it's a mix between making educated guesses and, and kind of deducing the, the proper number as you uh, continue on. And then eventually, if you don't guess it within six guesses, you lose. Uh, and then your reward is also determined by how quickly you get the, the right number. So if you win on your sixth guess, the, the reward is, you know, fine, but it's not a lot. Uh, and then if you, if you somehow manage to guess right on your first try, you get a shit ton of cash. Uh, you know, it would be a really bad idea if Atlas decided to make guessing right on the first guess uh, something that content was hidden behind. That would be ridiculous and, you know, would take hours upon hours of grinding, unnecessarily so, to, to be able to do that. Especially if you want to show it off in a Let's Play for an audience. Good thing Atlas would never do that to us and make us waste hours of our lives trying to guess a number correctly. Yeah. I got some shit to say about Codebreaker. But for now, we're gonna try and keep it out of our minds. Cause... It's just too late in the night. And I, uh... I got some feelings that I don't want to exp I, I just don't want to explore right now. We'll talk about Codebreaker later. So yeah, we got some cash though, we can go on a little bit of a shopping spree. We can finally get Bigfoot. And you know what they say about big feet. Big defense. So now that we have leg armor for our hero, we can finally go see what that ruckus is over at Tokyo Tower. While we're here, might as well sell off these guns. Just taking up inventory space, even though we don't really have inventory space in this game. Um, you know, it's just nice to have the extra cash. Uh, and also, uh, I'm not sure if I've warned you about this yet in this playthrough, but even if I have, it's nice to have reminders. Uh, be sure you don't accidentally sell off that members card, we're gonna want that for later. If you somehow manage to make your way over to Tokyo Tower without recruiting Orthrus first, uh, you will be blocked by that barrier, but now that we have Orthrus, he'll just punch on right through, and we can go inside. Again, just another example of this game being a bit more open-ended than one might think when you first start playing it. Kinda cool, I like it. Princess, witch, we, people, we gotta make up our mind. Though I guess you can be both a witch and a princess, the, those things aren't, you know, completely opposite. You know, one, you, can, you can be both, you, you don't have to be one or the other. And of course, doing the age-old JRPG NPC trick of backing up one tile and then choosing the other dialogue option when we go back to the NPC tile. Gotta love it. Classic. And yeah, if you haven't fused one already, I highly recommend you pick up a dwarf from this area just because it's nice to be able to buff up your defense a bit. Who doesn't want a demon with a uh, buff spell this early on in the game? Damn, Orthrus, okay. You know, something that I... A, a little detail I never noticed before uh, in my two previous playthroughs, um, and I'm just noticing it now because of, you know, I'm staring at the footage. 
Uh, never realized that there's hospital beds in the background, and considering that the NPCs have been talking about uh, Asuka here, uh, that she's been healing people and stuff like that. that. That's a nice little detail. I like that they have that in the background. And yeah, if you haven't been able to deduce it already, Pazuzu is clearly not the nicest demon around, and most likely just wants to take advantage of our skills in his little civil war with Bale. Ourselves! Yep, Ryu's completely drank the Kool-Aid. <laughs> And yeah, I agree with Asuka here. Sometimes you just gotta decide it's not worth it to argue with someone <laughs> when they're in that deep. Whew, okay, that's, uh, that's maybe jump into uh, conclusions a bit there, Ryu. Went from disagreeing about who we're working for to we're gonna be fucking enemies from here on out. <laughs> And also, I love this. Like, did we sign a fucking prenuptial agreement? What, he's taken half our cash. He's taken Solomon's ring. He's taken the dog, too. Oh, no. <laughs> he's taken the house. He's taken everything. Uh... It's okay, though, because we ended up getting a better party member out of it. So, Asuka is going to be taken along now, and she's going to be a pretty good dedicated magic user. So yeah, burn some bridges, make some new ones. <laughs> 